Okay, I got this email uh, recently. This is one of those emails that's really kind of profound. I didn't know whether to believe this or not. It really doesn't matter. I'd probably do the story anyway. But I kind of had a back and forth with this writer. And I'm almost convinced he's being very honest. There's He's not showing any signs, at least in an email exchange that lets me know he's making this up. He's not sensationalizing anything, and he seems very honest uh, when he uh, responds to me and in his story. So I'm going to read this story, and I think this is going to blow your doors off. It's really good, and it's really scary. Here's what he wrote to me. My brothers love to hunt and fish. They have thousands of dollars invested in gear. When hunting season is out, they're fishing. I like fishing, but not to the degree that they do. Now, I don't hunt. I have never enjoyed killing animals. I have nothing against hunting at all. It's a great way for people to enjoy the outdoors, gather clean meat, manage wildlife populations, but it's just not for me. My brothers make fun of me for this. That's okay. Well, I do mind, I guess, but I don't let them know it. It's not that I don't like being in nature. My thing is hiking. And if any one of them would take a minute to notice, they'd all see that I hike a lot deeper into the woods than any of them ever hunted. I don't carry weapons. I only carry bear spray. I know the truth, though. I know that I go farther and harder than any of them just to take long walks in the woods. In their minds, the fact that they kill animals with weapons, they're more macho than I am, but I know for a fact that none of them could keep up with me for even a half-day hike. I can outperform any of them, but I never say a word. Hiking is my favorite thing to do in my favorite places, in the woods, alone, just me and the trails and the animals and the fresh air and my endurance. I come alive out there, or... I did until last month. Now, I don't care if I ever go into the woods again. There are monsters in the woods, folks. I have seen them. Fall is a busy hiking season. Everyone wants to see the trees in full color. And if you're serious about hiking like I am or was, it means you have to go pretty deep in the woods to get away from the day hikers. Otherwise, you're just going to be tripping over the amateurs and not seeing anything because they're always so noisy that they chase animals away. And if you want to really enjoy the scenery and all that nature has to offer, then you'd better get there early, and I mean a day or two early, and plan on hiking in with your camping gear and enough supplies to stay a couple of days. I parked my car at the trailhead early on Wednesday. I figured I'd hike up for two days and then hike back down for two days and be home in my own bed by Sunday night and ready for work on Monday. I always check the weather before I leave and then I do a gear check. Now I'm an ultralight hiker with a hammock and a light down sleeping bag, a micro stove and just enough calories that I need to go as far as I like to go. I carry a change of clothes, a compass, a first aid kit and a knife. The less I carry, the lighter my backpack is, which means I can go farther. Hikers who are in shape and condition like me can run out of steam pretty fast with an extra heavy pack. I've seen them leave the trail many times just because their packs are too heavy. And a man learns to get by with a little, and the goal is not the gear, it's the trail. This is something my brothers will never understand. They're gear freaks. I had picked a difficult trail to hike because I knew there weren't a lot of day hikers. It's only well maintained for the first couple of miles. And after that, you have to know what you're doing to go any further. I was headed all the way to the top of this mountain. So I checked my watch and I stepped onto the trail. It was 7.43 a.m. At noon, I stopped for a break and to take in the view of the valley below me. The trees had been busy this year. It was already a blaze of reds and golds with bright splotches of yellow and dark patches of brown. There's something about sitting up there looking down on the world. A lot of people say it's humbling, but not for me. For me, it's empowering. 
By the time I set up camp the first night, civilization felt like another planet away. I picked a small clearing that gave me a decent but limited view of the night sky. The weatherman assured me that I would have clear sailing, and he was right. If you've ever seen the sky without light pollution, you've never really seen the sky. I went ahead and ate a couple of power bars and drank some water, and I climbed into my hammock. Now, nothing wears a body out like a long walk. I figured I'd be asleep within minutes, and I probably would have, but for one thing. It was too quiet. And when you go as far as this, there's also the absence of sound pollution. You can't hear cars and diesels rolling down the interstate. You can't hear radios blasting music or people chattering or kids playing because it's just you out there. But even then, there is always some sort of noise. There's insects and small critters and coyotes. I was lying there in my hammock that night. I didn't hear any of that. It was so weird that it made me a bit nervous. To make matters worse, and maybe because of that, I started feeling like I was being watched, and I didn't sleep well that night. The next morning, I discovered that the weatherman had lied to me. The brilliant blue sky I had hiked under the day before was turning gray so I had to make a decision. I could continue my hike up on the mountain, or I could turn around and head back down. The third option was to stay where I was and then head down the next day. I hadn't slept well the night before, and I had a lot to do with my decision. I didn't feel like going anywhere. I felt like sleeping a few more hours, so option three, it was. I made some coffee, and I ate a power bar before climbing back into my hammock. I lay there in broad daylight, still conscious of the fact that there were no normal sounds of nature around me. But by now, the sky was dark enough and the clouds overhead were full enough that I figured it was the rain coming in that had kept them silent. After a while, I decided that I wasn't going to sleep and the sky was looking bad enough that I should try to get as far down the mountain as I could before the clouds burst open and drenched me. It was around noon when I started back down the mountain, but the sky was as dark as dusk. To be safe, I had already pulled out my headlamp from my backpack and I was wearing it. Then the rain came. It didn't start with a sprinkle then a few heavy drops, and then a solid sheet of rain. It came down all at once as if God had dumped a bucket of water on me. Usually when it rains that hard, it doesn't last for long, but I must have walked for an hour in that downpour. It wasn't long before I began to feel like my bone marrow was saturated. My eyes burned from constantly wiping them, and the damn headlight began to short out. The sound of the rain beating the leaves off the trees drowned out all the other sounds in the forest. I don't really know what I expected to hear in this weather. Any creature with any common sense at all was holed up in a den somewhere. But every now and then I heard a crack of a branch that I didn't think was caused by the storm. Maybe it was lack of sleep from the night before. and Maybe I was just weirded out by the weather. Whatever the case, I could not get over the feeling that I was still being watched and followed. When I couldn't take it anymore, I started looking for a good spot to wait out the rain. I was hoping for a cave, but even a wide spot in the trail where I could hang up my hammock tarp would have been good enough for me. Looking around and seeing shadows in the woods freaked me out a little. Occasionally lightning would strike and I'd see something large moving. At first, I would think it was a tree, but then it would move. And then a bolt of lightning cracked, the sky opened, and I saw it. I've never believed in Bigfoot. It was a joke to me, and I had not thought about it ever. So what was standing in the woods 20 feet from me? It was 10 feet tall and covered in shaggy brown hair, except its face was clean-looking. The size of the thing was scary enough, but it was the face that scared me the most. Its skin was dark and its mouth was wide and its nostrils seemed to be flaring like it was angry. And I locked eyes with it and saw something that I can't quite put my finger on. It didn't take long to decide that this thing wanted to kill me and eat me. That was plain to see. 
It opened its mouth like it was stretching its jaws. Its fangs hung down like a baboon. I'm sure you've seen the pictures or the videos. It wasn't a yawn. He was showing me his teeth. My head would have fit into his mouth. And that's when panic set in. I don't know when or where I dropped my backpack, but it wasn't with me anymore. The trail had turned to a mud slick. I moved my feet, I think, and there was no grip to the earth, but I ran anyway. Abandoning the rules of what humans should do when facing a predator, I ran like hell. Trees started snapping and cracking behind me, and the chase was on from that first step, and I knew I was a dead man. I wasn't thinking at all. I was just running. I felt the vibrations of his feet hitting the ground behind me getting closer. I heard the heavy rush of air being sucked into and pushed out of its lungs. And ahead of me, the trail made a sharp turn. I knew I was going too fast in that slippery clay, but I wasn't about to slow down. So I launched myself into the woods like I was diving off into a swimming pool. It would only buy me a few feet before it caught up, but I wasn't giving up yet. And instead of hitting the ground, I was snatched backward by the shirt, and this thing's nails dug into my back. It turned me around to face it, and I was fighting like hell, kicking and throwing punches. I didn't hurt this thing a bit, but I remember it squinting its eyes when I would hit it in the face. The eyes... It was closing its eyes voluntarily to avoid my punches, and then I remembered the bear spray on my belt. In a fast, lucky grab, it came free from the holster, and I sprayed that bastard square in the face. Apparently, it released me and swung at me at the same time, I assumed to knock that can of burning the shit out of my eye stuff out of my hand, and then everything went black. I don't know how long I was out, but when I woke up, I was lying next to a pile of bones. I don't know what kind of bones they were. I remember deer skulls and other critters, but when I saw a human skull over at the edge, I knew I was in trouble. I heard something grunting. I remembered it from our fight. It was bent over a pool of water washing the bear spray out of its eyes. Hell yes, I thought. This thing's going to kill me, but I heard it, and that gave me a sense of victory. The desire to keep fighting and live was still there, and I looked for a way out of there. The trail we must have come in on was off to my left. I put my hand in the mud to get off the ground, and pain shot up my arm. I looked down, and I could see plainly that my wrist was broken, and I admit that tears rolled off my face. Broken bones might be the worst pain ever. I lifted my head and that monster had jumped up and was looking at me with those red swollen eyes and I pointed at it and I laughed out loud. Maybe I knew everything was lost and those blistered eyes just set me off. You ain't gonna forget me, you son of a bitch. That's exactly what I said to that Bigfoot. It came across that pile of bones and smelly rot and it snatched me up by my head, palming it like a basketball. It shook me, wrenching my neck, and then it started to squeeze. My skull was about to collapse. I was going to be defiant to the end, and I stared it straight in the eyes, and I started swinging again, trying to connect with its face, but my arms wouldn't reach it. That mouth came open, and those teeth came out, and its breath was horrible. He was enjoying this. I could see that plainly. And I was about to black out. Halfway between dead and alive, I remember feeling a swift gust of wind and then falling to the ground on my broken arm. I waited on my senses to come back from that head vice that he had me in and trying to get the pressure off my arm, and I didn't see where the monster went. I wasn't even thinking about it. I think looking back on it, I was in and out of consciousness and When I could finally think a little, I had a grand headache and my arm throbbed like crazy. There was no way I could get away now, feeling this dazed and confused, but I looked around anyway, trying to figure out a way that I might run. 
I got to my knees and over that pile of bones, and I saw two of those creatures now, and they were fighting. They looked just alike in my mind, and I watched them with blurry vision whip the crap out of each other. They were biting and hitting each other. In any other setting, it would have been awesome to watch, but I knew they were fighting over which one was going to eat me. I had to find a way and get out of there. I didn't know where I was, and there was no time to look at my compass, if I had even been able to find my compass. There was a path to my left I remembered, and it went downhill, and that is where I wanted to go, downhill and off this mountain. I staggered that way. It was but a few steps, and I got my balance, and I was running. Fifteen minutes or so later, I had to stop and catch my breath. That's when my arm started aching again, and I was getting dizzy, and I wondered what sort of damage that thing had done to my brain, but I was on my feet, and I started running again, always downhill. I wondered if the fight was over, and if either one of them even felt like coming after me. I remember hoping they had hurt each other so bad that they would call it quits, but they didn't. Even while running and heaving, I could hear that thing coming after me like a bulldozer off the hill behind me. I was staying on the trail, but this thing was bushwhacking straight at me through the thick woods like it was nothing. I didn't know if I could get away this time. I guess I figured it was over once again, but I had made it this far. Maybe I had a chance if I could just keep going. I headed straight down the trail and ran with all the strength that I had left. That's all I could do. Ahead, I could see daylight through the trees as if there was a clearing. I thought it was a field maybe, which was not good. For some reason, it felt better in the trees and the brush. In my mind, at least, that was something between it and me. In a field, I'd be easy to catch. I don't know why I thought these things. I guess our mind naturally works out any advantage that we can while in a situation like this. But the daylight I saw wasn't a field or a clearing. It was a ledge. It was the top of a bluff that dropped down into a river or a stream. I realized this after I fell several feet and saw the water coming up at me. When I hit the water, the cold felt good to me, almost like freedom. I hit the rocky bottom and luckily didn't break my arm worse than it was. My head popped out of the water and I looked back up at the spot where I think I fell from and I saw that thing standing at the edge and it was roaring at me. The current pulled me away from my enemy and he followed me down the ledge for a distance. I remember turning and looking ahead of me hoping the bluff that he was on didn't slope down to a bank because the way he was moving... He would have been able to keep up with me and eventually catch me. But as far as I could see, the bluff stayed at the same elevation where he stood and it even got higher in some places. Something kept him from jumping in after me. I'll never know what it was, but I'm glad he stayed on the bluff. I let the current just take me down river. A curve in the course of the river ahead took me around to a point where I could not see the monster anymore. I was beginning to think that I might make it out. I don't know how far I floated down that river, but it wasn't long before I was too cold to stay in the water. Now I was thinking about hyperthermia. At some point, I would have to get to the bank and try to warm up. But what I knew for sure was that I would not swim to the side of the river that that thing was on. Ahead, I saw a gravel bar and I started kicking to get there. My feet started digging in the gravel to push me closer and faster, and I could finally stand up. In front of me, in the distance, down the river, I saw a bridge. There were people on the bridge. I went straight into the river. I could take a few more minutes of cold. I needed help, and there it was right in front of me. There was a group of kids on the bridge, and they saw me, and I could hear them yelling. I managed to work my way to the bank. The first thing I did was look around both banks to see if I could make out that monster anywhere. I don't know how far I floated down that river, but I had not stopped thinking that he was following me the whole time. But when I looked up, I didn't see it anywhere. 
I stood up and started walking up to the road. The group of teenagers met me halfway and helped me up to the blacktop. An adult woman ran to me and threw a blanket over my back and shoulders. I was never more happy to see people in all my life. And not long after that, an ambulance pulled up. Someone must have called 911. They treated me with what they could, and they stabilized my arm, and they loaded me up and took me to the local hospital. The inside of that ambulance was so warm. I remember that vividly. At the hospital, doctors treated my wounds, and they put a cast on my arm, and they gave me some painkillers. I had broken ribs, they said, that I had never felt pain from. I guess that was from the tumble into the water. I was kept one night and discharged the next day, and someone from the hospital called a cab to take me to my car, and by that afternoon, I was home. Now, I'm not a writer, and I don't keep journals. Writing the thoughts and experiences of my life or day or week has always seemed like a waste of time to me. When I got home and after a long sleep, I woke late in the night and I thought that I would try to write my experience. I knew that as the years passed, I would forget the details, maybe forget the whole thing in sort of a mind-preserving blackout scenario. And I wanted to remember everything about this experience, no matter how disturbing it was for me, as strange as that may seem. For several hours, way into the daylight the next day, I wrote everything I could remember. Not all of what I wrote that day is in this email to you because, as I have heard you say before, stick to the story that you don't need the minute details that do not add to the story. So that is what I have sent you. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that. I will describe to you the most profound aspect of that day in my view. It wasn't that I was attacked and nearly eaten by one or more Sasquatch, and that may sound off kilter. It was at the hospital that weirder things happened. It isn't a complicated part of this story, so don't worry that I'm going to go on and on here, but to me, it's the most shocking. Naturally, I was questioned by the people who were taking care of my body about what had happened. That's usual stuff. What happened to you? Did you have a hiking accident? Yes, that's what happened to me, I told them. I slid off the mountain into the river. And I got lucky to have come out under a bridge where there were people. Oh, okay, they said. Looks like you had a bad day hiking. That was it. My injuries lined up with just that. Once they had me on painkillers and the edge had worn off and after some sleep, my head began to clear and I remembered what had happened. Now, it's not that I had forgotten. It had just been a crazy day with so much going on. But later that night, the activity had fallen off and I was alone in my room. It was quiet and I had my thoughts to myself. At some point after midnight and I had been dozing in and out, the door opened to my room. I expected the pesky nurse to come in and check my IV or my blood pressure or something. They're on a schedule to wake you every hour for that nonsense. This time it wasn't someone from the hospital Two men walked in my room. They pulled up chairs and they made themselves at home, sitting by my bed. I saw one reach into his jacket pocket. He pulled out a device and switched it on. A red light blinked a few times and he laid the device on the tray and then rolled it toward me. They were going to record what I said. Never once introducing themselves, the first words were, Now tell us what really happened. I just looked at them and I didn't speak. Neither did they. The silence was uncomfortable at first, but then I decided I wasn't going to say a word to these jerks, so I let the silence hang there. We're waiting, the other man said. I slipped off the trail in the rain, I said. I already told three people this. I'm going to repeat myself only once. Now you can tell us what really happened said the first man. Or what, I said. They sat in my room for several more minutes, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, and finally gathered themselves and left. And in all that time, we never spoke. 
I will never know who they were or where or what organization they came from. What I know for sure is that they knew what had happened to me that day. And that fact alone should say to everyone who reads this that they, whoever they is, know what is in the woods that we hike and camp and hunt and fish in. They know and they are not warning you or warning us. Why are they not warning us? Well, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? The day before, I had looked a myth in the face and laughed at him because I had hurt him. I had scalded his eyes with my bear spray. It was and is the best part of the whole story. The second part is that in my mind, I was laughing at those jackasses in my room that night in the same way. They weren't getting anything from me, and I knew it was scalding their ego, just like the bear spray had scalded that Bigfoot's eyes. Now, had I told them the truth or not, they would not have used the information to warn the public, so I was not going to conform. I doubt I will get back to hiking anytime soon, maybe never, but at least I know what I'm up against if I do. And now you know, and you can do whatever you want, But if you do go into the woods on this continent and you get caught in a situation like I was, fight like hell. You can survive it. That is the only advice I can give you. Okay, like I said, uh, this is a genuine email I got from somebody. Normally, I don't correspond back and forth with them to try to determine the validity or, you know, vet them or whatever, because I really don't care. But I, something about this email really made me inquisitive. And I emailed the gentleman back, and we, we probably went back and forth three or four times. And uh, I asked him to give me a few details. I asked him to tell me where this was. He doesn't want me to tell you exactly where it was, but it is in the uh, it's in Appalachia. I'll tell you that. It's, uh, it's up in the mountains in Appalachia. And that goes from Georgia all the way to Maine. So it's your guess is as good as mine. He didn't want to put a finger on the exact location. There it is. You've got it. You can decide whether you believe him or not. You can take the story serious or just take it as entertainment. But whatever you do, (laughs) it puts a little bit of thought in the back of your mind. In my opinion, it does me. So thank you to the gentleman for sending the story. It was uh, fantastic, scary as hell, even though it was scary for you. I enjoyed that story. I loved reading it. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.